Hey, I think we're live. Uh, very glad to welcome you to our Russia boot camp. It's sponsored by the Center for Eurasian, Russian, and East European Studies here at Georgetown University, and also generously funded by the Carnegie Corporation of New York. You know, um, I think some of you know that the, the last uh, journalist boot camp, as we called it, on Russia, was done in person on campus and it was really great. It was very kind of intimate and it gave a lot of uh, opportunity for asking questions. And this one, thanks to COVID, allows us to uh, include a lot more people. And that's, I think, really important. And the subject today couldn't be more important. You know, the, the idea that we had, the purpose of it, was to provide in-depth information on events that were going on. Not just, you know, the event itself, although that is important, but kind of the context and what it means in the context of Russia as a whole. And today, on on COVID, we're going to do, do that with two real experts, and that is Dr. Angela Stent. She is the director of Ceres, the Center for Eurasian, Russian, and East European Studies. She is a consummate expert on Russia and the former Soviet Union, and especially in that area of relations between Russia and the United States. She is the author of numerous books on Russia. Uh, the latest is Putin's World, Russia Against the West and with the Rest. Uh, it's a book that I use as a Bible for uh, understanding Putin, understanding Russia. And the other expert today is Judith Twigg. She, I uh, talked with her for a podcast that I'm doing, and I was so impressed. She also is at Georgetown. Uh, she's an adjunct professor at Ceres, and she's also Professor of Political Science at Virginia Commonwealth University. And she is a nationally known expert on health issues and especially health issues dealing with the former Soviet Union. So let's jump into this, you know, um, and I uh, note, I want to uh, make sure that everybody has a good opportunity to ask questions. And we're going to do that with the Q&A function that you find at the bottom of your screen. So feel free to start some questions. I'll try to monitor them, but into our discussion. So, um, it, you know, if you look at COVID-19, it struck Russia at the very time that there were, at, it was a confluence of really three different and very major events. One, of course, would be the virus itself, <clears throat> how Russia can cope with the virus. Number two was the economic situation, the collapse of oil prices, which ironically, uh, President Vladimir Putin himself ha happened to spark or helped to spark. And then the third was the political context. And at that very moment, we had the uh, plebiscite that was planned to be held on constitutional changes that would allow President Putin to stay in office until 2036. So he would be, I think it's 84 years old when he finally stepped down, if he even did at that point. So um, he had to postpone that from April 22nd to July 1st. And, you know, you could add a fourth, and anybody who knows Russia knows how important Victory Day is, the May 9th celebration of the victory over Nazi Germany. That also had to be postponed and uh, until June 24th, so we have something to look forward to. Um, the, this was supposed to be a very big event. President Putin was going to uh, invite leaders from other countries. That will not happen the way he expected it. So uh, let's jump right into it. Judith, uh, Judy, you are the expert in the actual, let's say, um, medical side of this. Could you give us an update? Russia is now, what, number three in the world, I believe, after the United States and Brazil. Uh, what's the current situation, and what is this, this uh, vaccine that I keep hearing that Russia has invented? Thanks for asking, Jill. Um, thanks for the invitation to participate in this panel, and welcome to everyone who has tuned in. Um, so let's start with just an overview of Russia's situation with COVID-19. There are currently about 550,000 confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Russia. And as Jill said, that puts Russia at number three in the world after the United States and Brazil. 
There have been about 7,300 confirmed deaths from COVID-19 in Russia, and that actually puts Russia very far down on the list of numbers of deaths globally. So that low case fatality rate uh, is something that we'll want to come back to later on. The first cases of coronavirus came into Russia in early March. Uh, the peak happened in the first couple of weeks of May when they were reporting 10 or 11,000 new cases a day. It has since leveled off in the last few weeks to about eight to 9,000 new cases reported every day. And they have reached a plateau. That is a very consistent, in fact, it's a sort of bizarrely cons consistently similar number that they're reporting every day over the last couple of weeks. So put that observation in the back of your minds because I think we'll wanna come back to the data quality question later on and what's actually happening with, with reported cases. Um, so there are four sort of introductory things I'd want to say quickly about what's happening with the pandemic in Russia. First is that it started out very Moscow centric. Uh, the virus first came into the country through Moscow. And as we went through the first couple of months of the epidemic, at least half of the new cases that were reported every day were in Moscow or Moscow Oblast, the region surrounding Moscow. So um, you know, very much centered around the capital, not surprising, centered around a major urban area where people are more crowded. Um, that's something that we've seen in other countries around the world, you know, New York, um, Wuhan, you know, so, so not, not a surprise there. Um, what we're seeing now that's more worrisome is over the last month, a fairly rapid progression of Russia's epidemic out of Moscow and into the regions. So over the last couple of weeks, we're down now to about 15 to 20% of the new reported cases every day in Moscow City. And if you lump in a Moscow Oblast with that, it's about a quarter of the new reported cases every day. So the burden of dealing with the pandemic has now shifted out to the regions, which are as a rule, much less well prepared to deal with the burden in terms of the healthcare system and, and what the medical profession would have to deal with. In fact, we're seeing some very worrisome reports out of St. Petersburg just in the last couple of days about lack of hospital capacity, about a handful of hospitals being over capacity with one or 200 people on a wait list with moderate to severe cases of COVID-19 who can't get hospital beds. Um, we're hearing about problems with um, floods and roofs caving in at uh, the new facility that was just built on a hurry up surge basis at the Lynn Expo facility where they've held the St. Petersburg Economic Forum at a couple of times. So even, even the country's second city, St. Petersburg is having quality of care and capacity issues. And of course, we've all heard about issues in places like Dagestan that have just been overrun with, uh, with pressure on their health system. So uh, they've already announced that the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Defense are sending personnel, uh, construction equipment, uh, and other kinds of infrastructure development capacity out to the regions. They need to do that quickly as the, uh, as the pandemic spreads out to the regions. Uh, the second of the four points I want to make is about that relatively low case fatality rate and about data quality. Um, and there's a lot to be said about this, but just a couple of points I'll make, and maybe that can start a discussion we'll have about this situation later. One is that I don't think there's some grand conspiracy being engineered by Putin in the Kremlin to somehow hide from the world and hide from his population um, what the real numbers with COVID-19 are. I think the truth is much more uh, subtle than that. I think partly it's a problem of how they record causes of death, which doesn't conform to World Health Organization standards so that if you die from COVID-19, you're counted as a COVID-19 death. But if you die with an underlying condition that was aggravated by COVID-19, it's a death with COVID-19 that doesn't get counted in those statistics. Um, so that artificially deflates the numbers compared to a lot of other countries around the world. Um, but as time goes on and we're able to report the, the numbers of deaths, say in March or April 2020, compared to March or April in previous Marches and Aprils of the last year or the last five or 10 years, I think we'll get a much better handle on what the real burden has been, what the real death toll has been in Russia. Um, the third thing I'd wanna raise for discussion is how Russia's healthcare system has dealt with the pandemic. Early on, the challenge was with personal protective equipment, shortages of masks, gowns, 
um, wide spread of the pandemic throughout Russia's healthcare system, spread through hospitals, spread to healthcare personnel. There have been tragic numbers of doctors and nurses and other medical personnel um, from COVID-19. That doesn't necessarily differentiate Russia too much from many other countries around the world. Um, and one of the good news stories, at least out of Moscow, is that something that many of us expected, which was a lot of stories about poor quality of care, about healthcare systems just being overwhelmed by the burden of, uh, you know, ventilator shortages, ventilator quality, um, that hasn't happened to the extent that, that many people expected. And of course, we have heard the tragic stories about uh, the deaths in Moscow and St. Petersburg from fires that were started by faulty ventilators. Um, again, the shortages of personal protective equipment, uh, the tragic stories of injuries and deaths of healthcare personnel who have um, fallen, um, probably attempted or, or achieved suicides out of out of high windows in hospitals and other facilities. So it's not a completely rosy picture, but it has been a healthcare system that has exhibited some considerable surge capacity to be able to deal with the pandemic in Moscow. Um, now we're about to see, I think, whether we will be able to say the same thing about the regions. And then the fourth issue that I'd want to bring up, and I'm sure this will transition into a into Angela's remarks since this is her era of expertise, and that is the political overlay on everything. Now, um, Russia is starting to open its economy back up again. It's opening due to political factors. It is opening much more quickly than you would expect if you were just following the public health metrics and the advice of public health professionals. Again, that sounds familiar. That's not something that necessarily differentiates Russia from, uh, from many other places in, in the rest of the world. But what has happened over time is that Putin has shifted responsibility for dealing with the pandemic from himself and the central government off to the regions. And that hasn't gone quite as he's planned. What it's done is uh, make himself seem um, out of touch, irrelevant, um, not really in tune with what's happening in the country. And we've seen relatively increasing poll numbers, public approval numbers among the regional governors rather than for Putin himself, who has seen his numbers on the decline over the last couple of weeks. So there's a big political incentive, incentive for Putin to start to open up things so that he can get to his big victory day parade in a couple of weekends and most of all his vote on the um, on the constitutional amendments. He wants to get that vote done as soon as he can before his political position erodes even more. And quite a bit more to say about the political imperatives that are driving the premature opening, but um, maybe we turn that over to Angela for, uh, for her insights. A perfect segue. Um, exactly leading into what we need to discuss with Angela, which is really, you know, I, I'd love to start with this hands-off approach by President Putin, because it, the expectation of President Putin, at least among the uninitiated, would be that he would take a really, you know, autocratic approach and he'd shut everything down and control. And oddly enough, he kind of uh, moved into the background. He didn't declare a state of emergency, as far as I know. And then he foisted off a lot of the responsibility for dealing with this to the governors and the regional leaders. So, Angela, I mean, <laughs> I guess, what explains this? And also, is he less of an autocrat than we thought? Or what is going on? <laughs> Thank you, Jill. That's a great question. Thank everyone for joining this and thank you, Judith, for your very interesting remarks. So COVID really is the kind of crisis that Putin really doesn't like, right? There's no visible enemy, no tangible enemy that you can immediately take steps against. You can't take decisive action against the enemy. You can't send troops there. You can't arrest them, whatever. You can't have a summit with them. And so it's this kind of diffuse um, enemy. And so I think it's really shown that he, this was not something that he's been used to dealing with, either given his training as, you know, a KGB agent in the old days, as president of Russia now for 20 years. And I think to some extent that explains it. Um, and it also shows that maybe authoritarian systems aren't that much better at dealing with this crisis. And I think the other thing it shows, and maybe we'll come back to this, is um, that the Russian people, like people around the world and like many in America, actually, um, some of them really don't want these restraints. 
Um, they don't want their, their freedom fettered. You mentioned, I think, Dagestan. We've had riots there, um, demonstrations. Other Russians, I, I would say, again, there's a parallel to this country, too. Some of the more democratic opposition Russians are the ones who say, you've got to stay at home, you've got to put your mask on. Alexei Navalny, you know, had a debate yesterday with a former uh, member of Yablaka of the Duma, where he said, you know, don't go out, stay at home, it's dangerous. And actually, the former Duma member said, no, 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 you've got to go out and vote against it. But anyway, so there's a real division in Russian society, but people are not just accepting lock, stock and barrel what parts of the government are telling them to do. And so it, indeed, you do see a much more, in a way, pluralistic society responding to this. Now, the problem for Putin is not only that he doesn't have a visible enemy, but as you mentioned, uh, Jill, there were these two major events that were supposed to consolidate his legitimacy in the past few months, and that was the great 75th anniversary of the end of World War II uh, victory parade with all these world leaders on May 9th that never took place. And instead, you had Putin going by himself, I think very symbolically, to the tomb of the unknown soldier uh, in the Alexander Gardens, placing a bunch of flowers there and saying a few words. That was the first one. And then we also know, and I'm sure Judith can talk about this, that the troops that were rehearsing to take part in that May 9th parade, many of them got sick with COVID. I mean, this was really a, a major problem. And then, of course, the second event uh, was supposed to have been on April 22nd, Lenin's birthday, um, the plebiscite Putin um, uh, and another two terms in office so that he could stay there till 2036, 10 years longer in office than Joseph Stalin was. And those two things, as you said, have been postponed. They're going to happen. But the, the atmosphere and the environment surrounding them is going to be less um, glorious, maybe, than it would have been had, had COVID not struck. Um, Putin's popularity rates, and Judith already mentioned that, have gone down. He has been seen rather as an isolated figure. He's mainly been at his residence in Nova Agadiova. He has occasionally addressed the public. I saw a picture of him yesterday um, uh, actually having a face-to-face -face conversation with an official and no one was wearing masks, which is also interesting. Um, uh, popularity rate down to 59%. Um, worse still, only 25% of the population say that they trust him. Um, and as you, again, as both of you have mentioned, the people who are more popular now are the Prime Minister, Mishustin himself, who survived uh, COVID, is back at work and, and seems to be doing quite well. And of course, the mayor of Moscow, Sebyanin, it, you know, you have the parallel there maybe with, with Andrew Cuomo in New York, you know, the mayors of the largest cities with the largest number of casualties, but they're really taking things in hand. And what's interesting is that uh, Mayor Sabiana has been forced now to reopen uh, Moscow because uh, Putin ordered it and because you have these upcoming events. Um, one doesn't really think that that's what he would have done. Um, had he had his brothers. And then um, Judith already mentioned the regional governors are also getting more, some of them, more attention and more popularity. So Putin as a kind of authoritative leader um, and figure has been somewhat tarnished. Now, as far as we know, 47% of the population, I think, have said that they do support the constitutional changes. I think that the Russian, like a 55% participation rate in this, Whatever happens, I'm sure that he's going to, it'll pass, and then we can question how they figured out what the numbers were. Um, so it is going to happen. Um, but there are also 47% of the population have said that they are dissatisfied uh, with the way that the government has handled the pandemic. Um, and I would say, and here's a real parallel with President Trump, President Putin, like President Trump, has, has tended to downplay the severity of the virus. Um, I don't, I mean, he did get dressed up in his yellow uh, PPE months ago when he visited the hospital, but I haven't seen him wearing a mask anytime soon. And he is the one, again, who wants to push for normalcy, for opening up the country, for having the parade, for having the uh, plebiscite, because for him, that is a show of a sign of strength. If you're a strong leader, you can kind of beat the virus, you don't need to take it so um, seriously. Um, and I think you know, we'll have to see then what happens to the incidences of infections after these public things have happened. Um, let me say a couple of things about the economy. So if you look back to Gorbachev uh, and you realize that oil was at $12 a barrel, 
Uh, most of the time he was in office, and as we know, Mr. Gaidar and everyone else said this really contributed to the breakup of the Soviet Union. Yeltsin had to deal with low oil prices, and again, you had uh, economic problems, you had the crash of 1998. And so looking at Russia, people might say, well, oil prices again are very low, demand has crashed, there was an ill-advised Russian-Saudi oil war uh, in March, largely initiated actually by the Russians. Um, and the, normally the budget, um, it, it calculates that a $42 a barrel of oil, you know, is what they can balance the budget and the economy can function well. Um, that's not where we are, but it is different this time. So Russia is less vulnerable to oil shocks than it was um, in the previous crisis. Russia still has $500 billion in reserve funds. Um, and the government appears to have the resources so far to keep the economy stable. Um, and you have, of course, also um, a variable uh, ruble rate. Um, the problem really is um, partly what has been done to, to save firms. And again, you've had a debate in Russia not totally dissimilar for what we, from what we have here. Why hasn't the government provided more money to small businesses? It's the small businesses and restaurants, et cetera, that, that are going to go out of business or already have. Um, and all the big enterprises have gotten support. So there's a huge debate raging in Russia at the moment about how best to deal with the economic fallout. Um, most people believe that the Russian economy will contract by 10% this year, which is a fairly sizable amount because of the combined impact of COVID um, and low oil prices. Um, and we've already heard from Judith Twig about you know, the costs also to the rather fragile public health system. Um, so there's, you know, there certainly will be um, economic, uh, you know, problems, economic effects of this pandemic that are going to be felt for some time. Now, having said all of that, um, yes, Putin's position appears to be weakened, but there is no alternative. So at the moment, <laughs> the referendum will go through. He will undoubtedly get the votes he wants. We can speculate about what happens further down. Um, and the final point I want to make, and I think we're going to come back to this in Q&A, is interestingly enough, so far, the pandemic has had virtually no impact on Russian foreign policy. Um, US-Russian relations, there have been more contacts between Trump and Putin, partly because of the COVID epidemic and partly for other reasons. We know that President Trump has now um, invited President Putin to come to an expanded G7 uh, in September. Um, so it has, been, it has been the occasion, at least for the two presidents, to intensify their contacts. But it, hasn't really improved the relationship. You know, only yesterday, as we know, Paul Whelan was sentenced to 16 years in prison um, on, on what, what are obviously trumped up charges. Um, the Russian-Chinese relationship, again, Russia, I think, is going to emerge from this more dependent on China than it was before we went into the epidemic. We can talk about this. And Russia is still active in the Middle East. We know it's quite active in Libya at the moment. Obviously, nothing has really happened in Ukraine to attenuate the conflict there. And so all of these um, are, are relatively low cost um, foreign policy actions, um, and they don't really seem to have been that much affected by uh, COVID. So I will stop there and see what your questions are. Uh, some great points. Um, I kind of I want to go back to Judy because you both raised little flags and I'm going to try to get to them. One is that idea, and you hear it in the Western press a lot, that uh, you know they're lying, they're trying to make it look like it's not as bad as it is, and you're saying it's a much more subtle thing. And I remember in, if you could go into that a little bit more, because I remember our discussion a few weeks back where you were talking about the old Soviet way of telling your superiors that everything is fine, or if it's not fine, covering it up and not saying it's not fine. So if you could, Judy, just kind of jump into that a little bit more with that context of the old behavior that, that's still there. I think there are a few older behaviors that are recurring now that dig deep back into the Soviet period and are also just features of this kind of you know, authoritarian vertical of power system that we have under Putin. 
One is this deeply ingrained instinct not to want to be the bearer of bad news. You know, you want you figure out what it is that the person who occupies the next rung up on the ladder from you, you figure out what they want to hear, and then you tell them what they want to hear. And that is clearly a model that's been established um, in this Putin system. Um, it's baked into the healthcare system based in some of the big national health projects that have been in effect um, billions of dollars worth of investment that have gone into Russia's healthcare system over the last 10 or 15 years, um, wrapped around most recently the May decrees that were set by Putin in the spring of 2012 and again in 2018, all centered around a series of health-related targets that um, in, you know, the whole made decree system, this isn't just in healthcare, um, but the, the whole economy and society has been wrapped around a lot of these targets that have been set by these made decrees. And target setting isn't a bad exercise if you wanna accomplish something, but it does tend to then establish incentives to meet those targets in ways that you may not intend. So the example that comes up all the time in the health system in Russia that predates COVID-19 has to do with target setting related to tuberculosis. Russia has been dealing with a horrific tuberculosis epidemic for many years and reduction in mortality from tuberculosis has been one of those health targets. And so when that became a target for people at the local levels to meet, people at health facilities, people at the local health administration and city government levels, um, they had choices about how you classify a cause of death. For example, someone who died of HIV AIDS whose opportunistic infection uh, that was their actual cause of death may have been tuberculosis, you know, the coroner has a choice about whether to code that death as a death from HIV AIDS or a death from tuberculosis. And so what a surprise when reduction in death from tuberculosis became a target, we all of a sudden started to see an increase in causes of death from HIV AIDS. Clearly there was some shifting in causes of death. So those habits are repeating now. We're seeing increases in deaths from community-acquired pneumonia rather than COVID-19. Well, surely those are people with COVID-19 in many cases, and we're just reporting the cause of death as something else because you think the boss doesn't want to see difficult COVID-19 figures. There are other things going on, though. Um, deaths in Russia have to be registered at the local civil registry by a relative who bring, uh, brings in a death certificate. Well, over the last couple of months, many of those local civil registry offices have been closed or their office hours have been greatly reduced. So I suspect that we just see a backlog of reporting of deaths because of a simple bureaucratic mechanism like office closures. Um, so th there's a lot that goes in into this. Um, and again, it means that we're not hearing about all of the deaths that are actually being experienced, but it's not some insidious top-down conspiracy to hide deaths that's making it happen. It's just a lot of unintended consequences of decisions about reporting and decision-making at the lower levels. Fascinating. I, I didn't know that last part about it. Um, you know, we just got a question in Q&A, and maybe I'll bring it up now because it's a Judy question, and then we can move on to Angela with some other amazing things that are happening. Um, one of our, um, uh, um, I was going to say, even right, our participants uh, is saying, as Russia wants to get its glory back, and a Sputnik moment will be wonderful, would a vaccine be a great opportunity to show that Russia still can make something that all the world wants? And he also asks, so why is the Kremlin not investing a lot in a vaccine? Is that correct that they're not? And then if you could answer that first part. Um, they actually are investing quite a bit in this race, and this is a global race to you know, acquire the, the glory and the prestige that would come from being the country or the lab that is the first to develop an effective vaccine. And there are multiple different pathways being pursued in vaccine development. And Russia is, is along quite a few of those pathways in both public and private laboratories in the country. Um, we're back to some old Soviet habits. Um, you know, even back in the Soviet period, Russia bragged a lot about having achieved a vaccine for HIV AIDS, which we certainly haven't seen in reality yet. And we're hearing now a lot of noise about Russia being very close or even having achieved a vaccine for COVID-19. Um, and we wish, you know, obviously the global community wishes them great luck with that. There's a lot of tremendous scientific talent in Russia working, working on this problem. Um, 
but I think the global health community will be surprised if Russia is the place where the effective vaccine first emerges. Mm -hmm. Angela, let me ask you, um, I really want to follow up on that issue of what happens when the president begins to devolve some of these responsibilities to other people, because in Russia, usually, if there's a vacuum of power, somebody's going to come in and fill it. And is there actually some, uh, let's say, a power struggle going on that we're just not seeing as, as clearly at this point? Or what do you think? Well, of course, if I could answer that definitively, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I could be paid an enormous amount of money. I mean, what I think we see is, let, let's walk this back a bit. I think the reason for Putin suggesting these constitutional changes and having this vote is precisely to avoid um, any visible or even invisible power struggle, right? I mean, as he was reelected for his fourth term, that you could already see in all the Russian media and everything, speculation about what comes next, who's up, who's down. Uh, and one of the names, obviously, that's come up um, periodically is that, and this is even before COVID, is, say, Mayor Sabianin, you know, who is a potential, obviously, successor candidate. So I think what Putin is trying to do now is to silence all of that, to say, okay, I can stay in power until 2036 if I want to. I'm not saying that he will. Uh, and he himself has said it's not clear if and when he'll run again, but he can. Now, will he, is he going to be successful in tamping down all of this talk of succession struggle? Probably not. Um, but, you know, what we've seen in the past is that whenever a name comes up, something happens and then sort of the name disappears. What's interesting is that Sabyanin, while to the outside world, he seems to have been pretty effective in this. There have obviously been other voices that you've seen emerging that have criticized him for what's happening, uh, for the way he's dealt with COVID. Um, so I am sure that the next generation in waiting, you know, they're looking, they're thinking. Um, but I would say at the moment, um, you know, the, 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 I think the net effect of what's happening now in this referendum will at least be to silence that for some time. Uh -huh. Judy, we have another health-related question here. Are COVID patterns similar to ours, with older people being at most risk? Although, of course, that has changed a little. But, um, and what about their prisons? What's happening? Uh, those are great, great questions. Yes, it appears as though older populations are most vulnerable uh, to moderate to severe disease and death in Russia as they are elsewhere in the world. That's one of the reasons why we may be seeing relatively low death rates so far in Russia, because Moscow City and Moscow Oblast are relatively young populations in, in Russia, and there is relatively low, compared to the rest of the country, relatively low incidence of the um, pre-existing conditions, the, uh, the heart disease, the lung disease, uh, diabetes, um, that we know are tremendously complicating factors that cause a uh, higher burden of moderate to severe, severe disease and, and death. Um, prisons are an enormous issue. In the Russian context, we don't have a lot of good data about what's going on. We have some anecdotal evidence that there have been some outbreaks in Russian prisons. And I would want to raise alongside that question the issue of what's happening with undocumented migrant labor in Russia. Um, also, a case where, or a risk group, where we don't have good numbers on what's happening, but we have a lot of anecdotal evidence about people who have not been able to get plane tickets home, and so they're stuck in incredibly crowded living conditions with very little access to public services, um, especially healthcare or COVID-19 testing, uh, for example. So it's likely that there's been quite a bit of, of spread among those populations that we haven't heard about. Mm -hmm. um, do you want me to ask Angela a question related to uh, absolutely. Bionin that, that came up? Um, sure. So, it, so the so Bionin and Putin dynamic has been interesting related to the rules around the pandemic, where as late as the last week of May, you heard Sobyanin talking about the need to keep these incredibly restrictive measures in place in Moscow for weeks or maybe months to come, that we certainly wouldn't ease up until the numbers of new cases every day was in the hundreds rather than in the thousands. And then there were reports two weekends ago that he and Putin had a chat and all of a sudden Sobyanin's tune 
changed, although he's still, um, you know, he's still sort of grumbling uh, about having to ease up on the restrictions, but you know, the policy obviously has changed now in Moscow. And some of the speculation in Russian social media is that they cut a deal to do a good cop, bad cop kind of thing so that Putin could deflect a lot of the responsibility for whatever the consequences might be um, off to Sovian and um, have you heard anything similar to that? What's, what's your take on what their relationship is right now? <laughs> so I haven't heard that, but I mean, that, that, that doesn't surprise me at all that people would think that, that it's deliberate. Um, by the way, I mean, as you well know, a number of Russian cities have said they're not gonna go ahead, for instance, with a Victory Day parade, because it's too dangerous. So um, I'm sure that when Mayor Sobyanin and President Putin had a chat, uh, and Mayor Sabianan was told this is what's going to happen, obviously he had to agree to it. Um, may, maybe, it maybe there is a tacit agreement that then he'll be blamed uh, when the number of cases go up. Clearly, he couldn't blame Putin if the number of cases go up. So, um, you know, I, I think he obviously had to defer um, to what the president wanted, apparently against his better instincts, because from everything I've seen of what he said, um, his message has been very, has been pretty draconian. Um, and, you know, it's only just last week that, you know, at least, at least older Muscovites were even allowed to leave their dwellings and walk around in the street. I mean, that really was pretty draconian. So th there may be such a deal, but I'm sure that for the people who live in Moscow um, and others, they will understand that if there is suddenly a spike in cases, that this was a decision that came from the president himself. Judy, I think this question would be best for you. How are the medical folk responding? Are they uh, protesting the lack of PPE and other supplies? This has been an incredible dynamic to watch over the last couple of months. The emergence of some in some very courageous and powerful voices coming from some health workers unions, some doctors unions and, and other sources, um, people who are speaking out um, even to the point of um, you know, letting the uh, video camera on their phone continue to run as they're being arrested for speaking out about uh, the shortage of PPE, the poor working conditions in their hospitals. Um, that's where we're getting a lot of our information about what's happening in the health sector. Um, not just in Moscow and St. Petersburg, from, and from around the country. And one of the most common complaints is non-payment of promised wage top-ups and bonus payments to healthcare workers who are supposed to be compensated for working uh, under conditions of the pandemic. There are too many places where those promised benefits aren't coming through, and we're hearing about it from the doctors. Hmm. Fascinating. You know, um, there's a great question about China, Angela, and I want to kind of drill down there. I'm, I must say the uh, level of questions is very high. <laughs> so, uh, but of course. One, and there, <laughs> of course, we expect nothing less. But um, there are broader questions, which maybe we can get to a little bit later, how all of this is going to play out internationally for Putin. But the Chinese-Russia relationship, I think, is really important. I remember at the very beginning, um, you know, the, the virus was coming from China. Russia, Putin very quickly cut off the border, or at least tried to cut off the border. But then, um, you know, there's, there's a different switch. And you mentioned that relationship with China. Uh, now you have the United States and China as the two forces kind of dealing with this. Russia in the middle, but not wanting to be uh, in, let's say, a subservient position to China. Can you walk us through some of those dynamics, Angela? Sure. So you're quite right that at the beginning of the pandemic, Russia closed its border with China very quickly. Um, there were Chinese complaints about that. Um, there were, for instance, a lot of Chinese students um, who were in Russia. Uh, in fact, one of our Georgetown students who's Chinese uh, was in Russia. We, I happened to be uh, to talk to him the other day. Anyway, um, and so uh, they, they started sending them back. And the Chinese also complained because there were some of the similar problems in Russia, frankly, that we've had in the United States with Russians picking on Chinese looking people and blaming them uh, you know, for what had happened. So there were quite a few tensions. And of course, the truth is that there were very few cases in the Russian Far East. And all of the cases, as Judith has said, 
were in Moscow in the west of Russia because these were all the Russians returning from skiing in Korshavel from the nice um, European vacations and they brought the virus back to Russia. So after a sort of an initial period of tension over this, um, Russia has now, Russia and China are now working together. Uh, the Chinese have sent um, uh, equipment and things to Russia. I don't know what the quality is, but they've certainly been, uh, they've sent um, medical personnel to advise the Russians and the Russians have completely 100%, the Russian government has got behind. We're working with China. Uh, we're not gonna you know, use terms like the Wuhan virus. We're not gonna blame China. Um, the Russians have criticized the United States a Russian spokesman for the way that some of our officials have, have talked about uh, what China did. And I think most of the people who look at this carefully do think that this Russia has now, you know, and, and Russia, by the way, has come out and criticized the West, the US, for criticizing what's happening in Hong Kong, what the Chinese have done. And so on a wide variety of issues, it's not that that wasn't there before, but I would say Putin has redoubled Russia's kind of support for China, verbal support, official support, and both, you know, bilateral declarations of, of close ties. Um, the Russians don't really want to be caught in the middle of a U.S.-China um, uh, argument. They see what's happening now. This is becoming more and more of a, of a U.S.-China problem, but they seem so far to have made their decision that at the moment being a junior partner to China is preferable to being a junior partner to the West. Um, and I think has probably just reinforced these tendencies. Yeah. Um, Judy, this is kind of like a soft power moment. I mean, you had right at the beginning, uh, you know, Russia sending what was it, ventilators and China sending PPE, et cetera. A lot of that didn't work out because the quality of both of those wasn't very good. But um, tell us about that, the use of soft power by uh, Russia, and you'd have to say China as well, it, it kind of gets into the United States too. Um, how did that all play out? And is it is it lasting, or was it just this moment where they decided to quickly try a soft power play and it didn't work out? Mm -hmm. So the use of health diplomacy in the broad landscape of Russia's soft power game um, predates COVID-19. But let, let me mention first, um, the, the real deployment for soft power purposes of health personnel and equipment during COVID-19 was early on to Italy um, when the outbreaks in Northern mm -hmm. Italy first took place. And that obviously was for show, um, but it was also when Russia uh, had barely any cases of COVID-19, but had to have realized that it was likely that they would have outbreaks to deal with. And it's widely perceived, I think correctly, that the deployment of Russian medical personnel to Italy early in the pandemic, you know, back, back in February and March, um, was so that Russian health personnel could get experience in this pandemic environment that they could then bring back to Moscow in the event that, that what took place would happen um, and they would have to deal with it themselves. Um, but broadly, Russia has been using health diplomacy as a foreign policy tool pretty effectively for a long time, but especially during the Trump administration. As the Trump administration has stepped back from uh, multilateral organizations, um, you know, most recently announcing the, the pullback from WHO. Um, you mentioned earlier, Jill, that um, if there's a vacuum created, someone will step into it. Well, as the United States has stepped back from many of these global health spaces, Russia has, uh, has not hesitated to enter into those conversations um, on tuberculosis, on non-communicable disease. Um, so this is a long game that Russia is playing with health diplomacy and you can bet that COVID-19 and especially the claims they want to make about their success in dealing with the pandemic with this incredibly low reported death rate, um, they'll want to trumpet that and use that as, as a global health tool moving forward. Mm -hmm. Angela, there's a question here, and it's, it's broad, but I'm not too sure how I would frame it any more precisely. And it really is, um, can you share your thoughts on how all of these issues that we're talking about, energy, oil prices, COVID, health, economy, et cetera, how should we think about this in the realm of Russian security and defense? Arms sale, uh, private military contractors, defense, et cetera. Let's, let's take a big picture. Where, how is this crisis going to, uh, what kind of effect will it have in Russia internationally? 
So it, it, that's a great question because um, so far, again, we haven't seen any real change. If you look at what Wagner's doing, right? Private military groups, be it in Syria, be it in Ukraine, uh, be it in different parts of Africa, uh, uh, you know, Libya, all these different places. Um, there, I mean, there were some reports that at the beginning of all of this, some measures were taken, you know, in terms of the actual troops themselves to try and limit their exposure to the virus. Um, although, I mean, Judith may have more concrete um, knowledge about this. I mean, it was the, the, what I read was rather vague. But what it hasn't done is really um, in any way limited any of these military operations. And I, as I say, we've seen an uptick, for instance, in Libya, um, uh, both with these private military contractors, with, uh, you know, the Russians sending air power and things like that. Um, so, and, and the, you know, in terms of the Ministry of Defense, we already talked about the fact that some of those troops that were taking part in preparations for the May 9th parade got sick. We'll see what happens now with the upcoming uh, June 24th parade. So uh, there doesn't seem to have been that much of an impact yet in terms of sort of security writ broadly or specifically the activities either of the Russian armed forces um, or of these private military groups where obviously they have much more leeway to do whatever they want. Mm -hmm. Judy, do you have thoughts on that kind of bigger picture? Mm -hmm. Um, so when I think about what the participation of or the impact um, of the military has been on COVID, I think of the interesting way that as the epidemic has moved out into Russia's regions, it hasn't been the Ministry of Health or uh, Raspatred Mamzor, um, any of the other institutions in Russia that have been called on to, to address it, it's been the military, it's been the Ministry of Defense mm -hmm. that has been called on to deploy military medical personnel, build field hospitals, engage in this emergency uh, construction of facilities. You know, in Comey, when we saw an early outbreak there, um, in a couple of the oil and gas facilities among the workers in, in Siberia, um, it, it's been the military that's been the go-to institution. Um, it'll be interesting to see how that impacts power dynamics uh, among the security services and between the security services and the Kremlin. Mm -hmm. You know, that just reminded me of something that I also learned from you, um, which is, you know, we have this image, and I certainly do, having seen this uh, myself, that in the regions, as you mentioned, medical care can be really lacking. I mean, hospitals without hot water, maybe out without water, period. Even hospitals I've been to in Moscow are not always up to the standards of the West. And yet Russia, to be fair, has invested quite a bit in the last, what, 10 years maybe in uh, the improvement of its medical system. But as you pointed out, it was more for these, let's say, heart disease, cancer, you know, things that are not a virus spread by people coughing. So t could you tell us, um, uh, you know, in the sense of Russia being prepared or not being prepared, it was spending money, but perhaps not on what this disease has brought to them. Russia has invested billions of dollars in its health sector over the last 10 or 15 years. And if you did a sector analysis of where they've spent that money, it's been in, in response to their largest health and demographic challenges. So one of their big problems is a declining birth rate. And so they spent lots of money in the health sector on building new high tech uh, neonatal care centers to make sure that moms could have safe pregnancies and babies at risk at the time of birth could, could be saved. So that made sense. Uh, the other big demographic problem was premature mortality among working age men due to heart disease, other conditions that ultimately trace back to uh, abuse of alcohol, tobacco, um, other behavioral issues. But uh, because of investment in cardiac care centers and resuscitation, resuscitation centers, um, now you know, the, the shorthand that people use to talk about it is that you used to die of your first heart attack in Russia, and now generally you don't anymore. You know, you get treatment when you have your first heart attack, and then you manage that condition um, over the rest of your lifetime. So there is lots of good new health infrastructure, not just in Moscow and St. Petersburg, but in a pretty good handful of other uh, large urban centers around the country to deal with moms and babies and people with non-communicable disease, heart disease, lung disease, cancer, um, that sort of thing. 
So one of the questions we had when COVID-19 started was, hmm, are they going to be able to quickly transition those facilities and that expertise into dealing with moderate to severe cases of a respiratory disease requiring artificial ventilation? And so far, at least in Moscow and St. Petersburg, Nizhny Novgorod, uh, Krasnodar, the answer seems to be better than a lot of people thought. Um, mm. that, that the problem hasn't necessarily been, and again, obviously there have been exceptions, there are some horror stories, but overall the surge capacity has been there, they've been able to convert the facilities when they've needed to, um, and the personnel have been able to shift to where they've been needed. Mm -hmm. Good news. Um, yeah. You know, there's a question that just came up and it kind of uh, follows very well. Russia has been struggling with a demographic crisis for a long time. Does COVID exacerbate worries about the future of the Russian workforce? Is that playing out in maternity, capital, pensions, social spending, et cetera? Judy, I guess that is you, and then we'll get back to Angela. So, so far, the number of reported deaths from COVID has been 7,300, 7,400. So even if the real number is, say, twice that or three times that, um, that's not enough excess deaths to really you know, nibble away in a, in a significant level at the overall burden of mortality. So the problem mm -hmm. with Russia's demographic trends actually predates COVID-19. Over the last couple of years, we've seen a, a re-emergence of a decline in the birth rate and an increase in the mortality rate, largely due to the decline in the economy and, and I think just an overall increase in, in pessimism about where, where the country is going. So. Um, COVID-19 obviously is, isn't good news for any of these trends, but I don't think it's a, it's a serious uh, impact on any of those trends. They, they existed before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Angela, let me get back to those big questions. <laughs> but one is, um, it, it feels, and you can, I'm sure, phrase this better than I can, but it feels as if, especially when you have the United States and China, and then Russia in the middle, but especially those two different systems coming up against the same disease, mm -hmm. that it raises the issue of kind of like um, uh, the, the system, you know, whether a more controlled, centrally controlled Communist Party, et cetera, system, which we would call autocratic, they would call probably more stable, can manage a disease like this, a challenge like this, or is it the United States, albeit with our problems, a more Western, described as democratic system? Um, how do you think this debate, how do you think COVID will affect this debate about the systems and how they are capable of dealing with challenges like this? Angela? Yeah, I mean, it's a terrific question. I think what we know up till now is that smaller democracies have handled this very well. New Zealand, Germany has really handled it pretty well. Sweden is controversial because obviously they didn't have all of these restrictive measures. But smaller countries that are democracies where um, you know, leaders don't question the scientific evidence. I mean, Angela Merkel, for instance, is herself a scientist, and she has, I think, had a very sane approach to all of this. They've done very well with it. I don't think we have much uh, track record of saying that authoritarian systems have handled this well. We know what happened in China. They suppressed the knowledge of this, mm -hmm. devastating costs, because they didn't want the population to know about this. Well, then once they let it, you know, it was let out and they admitted it. Now they appear to be handling it better. And then you come to the United States. I mean, we can have a debate about this, but we have not handled it very well, right? We have the largest number of cases. We've got the largest number of deaths. And that's not because we don't have free discussion. We do. It's not because we don't have good scientists, but alas, we've had the leadership or some of our leaders that haven't been willing to listen to that and have put, you know, po politics in an upcoming election right, above um, you know, the scientific evidence. And I think we also in this country, um, you know, the, the tradition where people value very much their own personal individual liberty and freedom, we've seen that that has mitigated um, against people accepting restrictions that are suggested to them. And we're not gonna have police out in the street enforcing a lot of any of these health um, issues. And that's made it more difficult too. So I think, I think the debate about this is going to be, 
it's going to be, yes, autocracies versus democracies, but it's also the kind of democracy, the kind of democratic system and leadership, um, irrespective of what kind of system you have, leadership is very important. Yeah. Um, I guess, let's see, we have, well, we have four more minutes. Judy, do you want to chime in on that? Because you're at the intersection, you know, of health and politics. So what's your view on that? Uh, a lot of Putin's legitimacy derives from the sense that he can get things done. And it's interesting to think about the extent to which this crisis erodes that in a couple of different ways. One is the balance of power between Moscow and the regions. Um, you know, Angela observed earlier that, um, that COVID-19 entered Russia through rich people who uh, live in Moscow coming back from their ski vacations in, in Western Europe. Many of those people, those rich people, then carried coronavirus out with them to their home regions in the rest of the country's 11 time zones. And there's a huge amount of resentment um, in the regions where, where the coronavirus epidemic has, has spread to the regions. They're actually looking at the individual rich person in their area that that they can blame for having brought the virus in from Moscow. So um, in addition to the emergence of these regional governors as, as having some newfound stature and legitimacy, there's also just some resentment of Moscow that's, that's come out of the pandemic that's been interesting. And then I think we need to mention the role of civil society in the pandemic. There has been enormous energy bubbling up from the bottom in social services, you know, where the government has just been absent, um, you know, left huge cracks in provision of basic services to people and um, individuals, new organizations, neighborhood um, led, community led have sprung up to provide services to neighbors um, to groups of vulnerable people, um, to um, you know, homeless animals and animal shelters. I mean, you can go mm -hmm. across such a broad range of types of groups of people <clears throat> that are now receiving services, not from the government that's supposed to be providing it for them, but themselves. And it's gonna be interesting to watch the extent to which that energy and legitimacy of a new wave of civil society um, capacity and activism gets sustained over time. I think that's a great note to end on because that, that is something that's been on my mind too. As I look, you know, I, I, I taught a course at Georgetown last semester on young people, the Putin generation, and I'll be teaching another course in the fall. And as I look at Russia, I think, you know, there's the old debate about whether they can ever be democratic, et cetera. And the, you have to say that in the macro sense, the country still deals with the lack of competition and Putin as the only leader, et cetera. I think some of that may be changing, but exactly what Judy's talking about, and I know Angela and I have talked about this too, that there are these little green shoots of civic and civil society and civic action in the regions over pollution, as, as you were mentioning, the, uh, you know, animal rights and um, hospice is there are other things people are beginning to volunteer. And so I think COVID, in a, although it is a devastating illness, may be able to speed up some of that responsibility on the local level that Russians have for themselves to improve their society. So this was, I have to thank you both um, for really excellent discussion. And thank you very much to our participants who uh, listened and, and gave us some wonderful questions. Uh, we will invite you back for, to another Russia boot camp sponsored by Ceres, which is a center for Eurasian, Russian, and East European studies at Georgetown University. And again, a very big thanks to the, for the funding to the Carnegie Corporation of New York. So thank you very much. Have a good day. And we'll think about what we heard today. <laughs>